cool stuff, but just terribly hard to change, I guess. Yeah, and lucky we don't have those restrictions here, so at least we can make a start on your systems. Another question? Sort of related to that, was it just to do with identification? So they actually knew who was transmitting, or was it just the fact that they didn't like that? No, so, um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, as David said, it's, it's to do, it's, it's more to do with the emission modes that are permitted in the, in, in the states. Um, I'm not sure why the FCC has, has, has placed the restrictions, but I know that they've been there for some time. Um, it, it's probably one that would be better for Bruce, but I thought I'd ask David. Um, yeah. Because I know Bruce is very passionate about the topic, but unfortunately he's not here. So. Yeah, I, I'm not interested in flame wars, but uh, yeah, yeah. Any further questions? You mean I'm going to have to ask all the questions of the audience? This one. I had a comment just on open radio. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, radio has been spoilt for the last probably 50 or so years in that it's had pretty open standards of interoperability. So even if you buy hardware from different manufacturers and different systems, you know, FM modulation is FM modulation. Um, it's, it's always going to work. And we haven't really had to worry about it too much with the development of digital modes and uh, digital voice comms, that sort of thing. It's going to become more important that we establish open systems early and strongly to avoid vendor lock-in or, or vendor lock-out um, and bumping up against licensing and, and patent issues. Um, if you have a look at uh, Wi-Fi you know, in every laptop, if you don't have a look at uh, the infrastructure modes, they are mostly compatible. If you have a look at the ad hoc mode, which is you know node to node stuff, um, almost no two different chipsets implement that in the same way, and that's because the way the whole um, I assume it's the IEEE uh, process to put that standard together, you effectively can't implement the ad hoc thing without tripping over all the patent palaver that goes with that. And so there's been a lot of people who've been trying to fix that within the system of the, the IEEE and the, and, the, and the ISO standard system. But, you know, we could have done a lot more useful stuff with ad hoc mode and meshing stuff over the years. There's been a lot of community wireless groups that wanted to use it, but it's completely unusable unless everybody uses the same Wi-Fi card and the same Wi-Fi chipset. So, you know, we've been tripping over that for 15 years um, and it's not getting any better. So the, the open standards we're actually, the standard as published is not tripping over the patents is actually really important. Um, on the on the subject of closed source incompatible radio systems, um, relating to that is D-Star. What are your thoughts on the usage of that? Because I'm aware that some countries are banned it on the amateur radio band. There's a fairly strong commercial lobby um, requesting that it be allowed. Some people maintain that it's essentially a form of encryption because there's no software implementation, only black box chips. Um, what are your thoughts about the usage of that? Oh, well, I'll start off with a, a comment. I, I haven't bought that sort of rig. Um, to put it in context, I had a, f a fire, lost all my radio gears, had uh, some monies available to buy gear, and I deliberately didn't buy something with um, that sort of closed technology in there. I think it's a threat. Um, it's not a... It's, it's, it, it, it's not... D-Star on its own is not bad because there are multiple things you can get with the chip in them, but in the long term that sort of proposed, that sort of process will get worse. But I'm happy to debate it. Um, with with D-Star, to, to actually get people to um, take up the technology, um, ICOM actually had to uh, give away repeaters to actually get people onto the system. So I think it's virtually a dead end. Yeah, it is. There, it is, but there are the Open Star initiatives, which are open source and open hardware alternatives to D Star, even though they do use the proprietary codec. 
they're just waiting for David's codec to be readily available in <laughs> hardware form. <laughs> and that'll happen at some point. Um, you look in Sydney, there's now several repeaters that are running APCO P25. But the only reason they're running in terms of amateur stations is all of this is ex Olympics kit mm. that sat in a warehouse for 10 years before it was given away to various um, groups. Um, it's still proprietary, it's still closed, and it still restricts you. Uh, APCO 25 was closed. Okay. Tell me a brand other than Motorola that ships with it. Hey. Oh, there you go. The one that's even more expensive. Uh, and <laughs> <Hey>, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> smaller radio manufacturers yeah. are doing a P25 but it's it's an open defined standard you can and and people have have used new radio and and other platforms to implement a P25 transceiver so there's no reason why P25 couldn't fill the hole that that D star is trying to um, uh, with suitable support from vendors and, and the community um, don't look at my employer to do that though, we're, we're not interested. But there is tons of second hand gear available. Mm -hmm. So, um, taking that theme of, you know, DSTAR's proprietary and there are other uh, open source initiatives coming along in terms of the encoding, the software level, um, and we're looking at things like the Raspberry Pi and, and encoding you know, raw data off pins to do the um, the RF component, are there, other than things like the USERP, that actually do the transmit as well? Because there's loads and loads of cheap TV dongles where you can receive on, but um, the what stuff is out there that we could build? Um, you know, I want to get in there to build stuff on channels that we now have that there just isn't amateur radio kit for, like, you know, the MF and LF channels. So what's, what's out there we can actually use to take digital stuff and then, you know, build a, a transmitter or receive pair on? Um, so you could take Softrock or one of the other designs and shift that frequency. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, 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 a um, there's a mob in the States. There's a mob in the States that have just released or are in the process of developing, I think. They, they were about to release and then they changed the design. Um, and so they're redesigning it. It's, uh, it's not for low frequency, but it's basically a, a Linux machine bolted to a 70 centimetre radio. And they're touting it as an open development platform for um, use within amateur radio. Now, I know it does have some proprietary um, codec chips in it, but you can certainly use that platform um, to, you know, develop digital comms on. Um, Uh, also, the, the Hack RF and Blade RS stuff we mentioned before, they both transmit. So, yeah, that's a, they're, yeah, yeah they, they do pretty well. Yeah, the, the, um, the Hack RF thing, it, it basically is a very low power transmit, transceiver. Um, it's, you need two of them to do full duplex. So to produce a, a, a GSM, um, tower equivalent or whatever, you'd need two of them. But that's that's the only limitation. It's not necessarily an absolute requirement either. Uh, things like PSK thirty one and, and David's modem and, and you know all the various digital modes have shown that all you need is a, a computer and a sound card and an SSB transceiver. Um, and you can play around with digital stuff using your existing kit. Uh, and get improvements o on top of, you know, your, your analog uh, or your traditional analog radio. So don't think just because you haven't got the hardware now, you can't play with it now. You, you, you more than likely will already have all the bits you need to get started. Um, and having something like a Hack RF or, or a USRP or something would just be a nice extra to have, but it, it, shouldn't, be a, it shouldn't preclude you from getting involved. Now, does everyone know what a soft rock is? Or very expensive USRP. <laughs> very expensive. Not when <laughs> so you talk about amateurs who spend ten thousand dollars on a radio. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, they're they're less than a hundred dollars for the for a transceiver. Mm. But you know, it's a kit. As, as, 
So there's that sort of the, there's several there's several variants of that around. So in the amateur radio community, it seems like every day uh, there's another manufacturer coming out with some form of SDR transceiver, be it a, you know, all band, all mode, whiz bang, plug it into your sound card and your computer and install this piece of software and, and you can do everything with this little white box. For Windows. Uh, well, yeah, for Windows. What do you see, um, do you think that the, that, um, SDRs are going to eventually replace the traditional, you know, SSB receiver that takes up half the desk. Um, and if so, do you think that um, as time goes on that the, those transceivers are going to become more and more open or are we doomed? Do you think whether that, re, you know, realistically we're doomed to um, corporate white box SDRs? I think, the, I think the classic vendors are starting to disappear. They're losing interest. There's just not enough amateurs for them. Um, Motorola and the likes, they're losing interest in the amateur market. Um, no, Yezu yeah, no. <laughs> hasn't brought out a new product in nearly 10 years. They're, they're not interested anymore, except for the really high-end kit. So I actually suspect you're going to see more modules come out from smaller companies that give amateurs the ability to just cut their own or to build their own kits. So my, my, my question is, in the future, do you think they'll be open or do you think they'll still be closed white box solutions? So, so the question was, will, it be, will they be open or closed? I would say it would be, be very much open. The hardware in SDR is incredibly simple. I think you'll probably end up... Yeah. I, I think you'll probably end up with boxes that essentially have whether it be a USB interface or just an INQ interface, like sound card style, whatever, where it's fairly irrelevant what's happening in the box as long as it's fully documented because everything that you're interested in is going to be done on the software side anyway, which is what the soft rock is, but, you know, on drugs. So, I think so. so this morning, Keith and Bedell were talking about um, being able to source... Um, a chip that did all of what they needed to do and running out of supply of that particular piece of uh, silicon because the manufacturer ceased making it or um, being, a, being able to make the, the, the soft decision rather than the hard decision and getting it as a bit. So if that's an open design, then we could roll our own. But if it's a black box design, then you have to do crazy stuff like Keith is talking about in doing, you know, squillions of interrupts just to be able to sample the decision. I mean, that doesn't sound like a, a solution if you're saying that everything, if it's closed, it doesn't matter. So, so, so the, the chips that they're using are commodity chips for specific applications yeah. at very low power. And very small. And and Hang on. The sort of solutions he's looking at is commodity little chips that are being used in, you know, remote controls and all these sorts of things. They're large volume chips. It's actually hard to get them if you're doing only 100 of them. Um, when you're dealing with, you know, they talk, talk about, was it ROC? ROC FS or whatever it was, uh, HF, the RF, that sort of thing. These, these DSP based. Um, FPGA based hardware, well, you know, those are always available. Um, and even if the particular chip you're using is not available, you just move to a new model. Um, it's not a big issue. You're not dealing with trying to make it really small. You want to, you know, something that does a really big job for you in your particular, you know, this sort of very fluid world. Um, whereas they're looking for a very specific application for very specific design. The weight matters. And weight matters. You know, so there, you know, his comment, oh, I had to go and do this and that and that, that was because of the chip he picked, because of his weight, because of his particular requirements. There's at least 10 chips that I, I thought of when I did a bit of a search that would have done everything he wanted, but one, they were more expensive, and two, they were much bigger, <laughs> you know, so, and he wasn't going to pick them because of that. Yeah, and, and also you've got power budgets as well. That are, that are there. Um, my, my personal opinion on, the, on that is I, I think we will see things go both directions. There'll be some proprietary stuff come out that's 
aimed at commercial, but it'll be the same as the, the little Chinese handy talkie I've got here. It'll be wideband and they'll try and sell it into every market. Um, and if they're $40, the fact that they're proprietary will not stop the average amateur getting in there. So what we have to do is get in there first with the, these are the standards we want um, and, and, and this is the, the standard of openness that we, we expect. Um, while we're talking about hardware and obtaining chips, um, I do some stuff with my radio club about building uh, uh, packaging kits to send to people to build their own stuff um, and it's something I see less and less of around and um, I think that if you know obviously B Dale uh, kits his stuff and sends out complete things and he's doing surface mount stuff which is you know requires a little bit more uh, gear to build than you know through hole stuff but um, if one of, the, one of the big problems we see is, is that if we want to go and buy 1N34 diodes, which are you know, not made of unobtainium nowadays, but we have to buy in quantities of 1,000 minimum or 5,000 typically, um, we're starting to run out into, we just don't get, we can't find parts um, like that. So <laughs> we find having to find replacement parts of our own for really simple stuff, well, what we think is really simple stuff like just diodes. Um, um, kitting up these things in the amateur market, we're seeing less and less kits available because there's less and less parts suppliers doing this sort of stuff at the basic level because more and more of it's moving to IC packages to do everything in a package. But, you know, the understanding of, okay, here's some discrete stuff, we grok that, moving to, to ICs is, you know, much more complicated, much more black box in itself. Um, how about the future of amateurs producing kits and clubs and doing that sort of stuff to, to, for the wider amateur and non-amateur community, I suppose. So how are we um, looking forward? What, does that look, what do you think that looks going to look like? Thanks. Yeah, I echo what you're saying there. Um, I'm seriously old enough to remember the days when we could buy discrete components. We had uh, a number of outlets here in Perth, um, General Accessories, Atkins, Carlisle, Willis Trading, to name three. And um, these days, you're really struggling to find um, yeah, generic parts, assuming that you can at all. Uh, most of my stuff, if I need it, comes from eBay, which is a bit, bit sad. You know, it'd be nice to source locally. I think the issue with the commercial side of things is that the, the commercial companies are in business to make money. And they're going to create uh, solutions which they, uh, in which their intellectual property is going to be guarded fairly jealously. Unfortunately, that may create multiple standards around the place and isn't it not so nice to have so many standards from which to choose. The problem that we face is that we would like to get back to perhaps more generic situations where we can actually exploit something other than a jungle chip which does a specific task and can't really do anything beyond that task until we can sort of break into it. So yeah, basically it's, it's I guess it's um, saying what others have said um, similarly. Just picking up on what you said about getting parts and finding it very difficult, to, especially in volume, isn't there an idea for half a project there to get all the hacker spaces and all the amateur groups around Australia together and start some group buys? You try and get, you try and coordinate. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's got to start somewhere. <laughs> That's actually a really good point. Um, hacker spaces and amateur radio clubs. Uh, well, our, our local uh, hackerspace in Adelaide is actually doing more interesting stuff and um, there started to be more amateurs move, well, people who are in hackerspace getting their amateur licence and start going in those directions and um, my radio club's average age is not quite double my age, but you get the point, right? Um, hackerspace, the people in hackerspace average age is a little bit less than half my age. Um, so. It's almost the new amateur radio clubs of kind of the future is the hacker spaces doing that kind of interesting stuff. So um, that's always the thing in amateur radio that people go, hey, you know, like we're worried about the new generation not grokking this and not getting into it. They are, it's just that they're not doing it in the, in the way that is expected. So hacker space is kind of what the radio clubs of the future are probably going to start out as and, and move in that direction, even though they're doing loads of other stuff, you know. Um, 
so yes, the hackerspace is a, a really good place to key um, uh, is to look towards for that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not an amateur in any sense yet, but um, I do a bit of playing around with um, uh, two-way radio modules. And the problem I found is that even though some of them you can obtain not too difficult on eBay and some of the better electronic sites, documentation is a problem. Even though they're not closed source, the documentation may run to a couple of hundred pages, but they often leave out very important little bits. And when you're trying to in implement your software, you run into enormous brick walls until you find other people that have played with these chips and go, oh, yeah, you've got to do so and so before it works. You mean like CPU vendors? That's because <laughs> most of the chips are designed for mass production and to be tinkered with by engineers for commercial products in mass production. And when they're in that situation, they get vendor support for the stuff that's not in the docs. You mentioned earlier that you um, advocated starting standards and documenting standards and uh, wanting amateur community to start outlining standards. Do you think the WIA has a place in that? And does the WIA currently do anything in that space? Yeah, the answer was yes and no. I wasn't going to say that yes. Um, that, yeah, the, the, the WIA has, a, a, has that, but it'll only do what its members ask it to do. So you've all got to, if you want that, them to do it, you all A, a have to join and B have to make a noise. So you put your hand up and do it. <laughs> well, that was the noise bit. <laughs> so who here is a WIA member? And it's willing to run <laughs> <laughs> That's not the second question. <laughs> Uh, so, have we got any any other topics we want to talk about? How do you get new amateurs into this hobby? So, so the question was, how do we get new amateurs into the into this hobby? The hobby being amateur being amateur radio. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is more an observation. I've been interested in radio and electronics since I was about six. I've never become an amateur radio and uh, ra radio operator, and it's never really appealed to me that things like the radio comp that we saw earlier in the day. I'm really still fascinated by radio, but I'm much more interested in things like Zigbee. I mean, all these things that you're talking about that happen in the hacker space, and I think you know if the WI. A wants to change its demographic. It needs to focus more on those things, those things that probably appeal to a much larger part of the population than those that want to make contact with somebody, you know, 30 kilometres away at 10 gigahertz or whatever. That's not that's not really what turns them on. So to get more people interested in amateur radio, redefine amateur radio. I, I got interested in amateur radio after um, joining my local hackerspace, so that's one way of doing things. Yeah, for most of its life, amateur radio has been the means to its end. It, 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 it's, it's a self-enclosed um, insular hobby where you, you get involved to do amateur radio stuff, whereas if it's uh, touching more with hackerspace and, and the general, you know, the, the maker community and that sort of thing, amateur radio could be uh, more of a, uh, a conduit to other things. So, you know, get your licence and you can hook your Arduino up to a 100 watt transmitter and do interesting stuff that way, or, you know, it allows you to play in spectrum and with powers and with systems which the general public can't do because they're not licensed and we should probably be promoting that aspect of it that you do get extra privileges when you have an amateur license and you can do interesting things with them not just amateur radio stuff but you know other stuff as well yeah, 
uh, agreed with that, um, Adrian. And I think that it's important that we maintain um, you know, licensing as a condition because otherwise, uh, you know, our spectrum space is going to be sort of somewhat squandered. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the comment I'll make on that is we've got more spectrum space than we had when I became an amateur 40 years ago. Quite a bit. Okay, so, 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 so this is a direct question to the panel and I'd like to know the, the, um, the responses from all three individuals. What do you think the abundance of low power, unlicensed ISM modules being made available to the public legally that can be experimented with what do you think the impact that, that that is having directly on the number of licensees and ham radio in general? You mean lipids? Lipids, yeah. ISM, ISM band low power devices that uh, don't require a license. So stuff like 2.4 gig and 2 .4, 40 meg. 33, 50 megs. The, the, the whole I'm actually... Because um, if, if you read the lipid document, there's a, a table of frequencies about this long. Yeah. That yeah. Do not require a license that anyone can use. I know quite a few people have got into ham radio through Wi-Fi, started playing with antennas, and yeah, like Kim, for example. Yeah, so it's been a way to start, and then they want to stretch it a bit further, so it's brought a lot of young blood uh, who are IT savvy into ham radio. So you see it as, as an enabler rather than a... Yeah. yeah, I've never... I mean, and except when I did 2.4 gig, I've never been interfered by <laughs> <laughs> that, except when I've been one of the unlicensed users, so fair cop, I guess, yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, to be honest, I hadn't thought about it, but um, I can hear what um, David's saying that it can, and, and yourself, can be an enabler. Um, is there going to be then an, uh, an incentive for those who begin working with these small devices to actually progress to amateur ranks? Well, the converse is there. Is, is there an incentive to get the amateur ranks in the first place when they can already experiment with these devices? I guess that's the bigger question. <laughs> so so the, the question is... It, is the is it going to help amateur radio, or is it going to uh, cause us grief? I think it'll help amateur radio uh, potentially if if we manage it the right way, which is we've got to go and market amateur radio to those users, saying you can do so much more, and here's how to do it. Here's how to do it. Um, then we had someone up the back, and and you. I'll go. Who was up the back? No? Yeah, right up. Uh, with the ISM band stuff, um, you can get a, an ISM band transceiver for two or three dollars, and um, that's how I really started looking at uh, remote controlled hardware. Um, was by getting one of these cheap little um, uh, transceivers. It had almost no um, digital components on it at all. Um, and I had to completely, uh, I had to write a, a error correction protocol because it was so flimsy. And um, that really set me on my way to actually looking into radio hardware. I'm going to get a couple of hecklers for this response, I suspect. Um, <clears throat> I got into amateur radio about three years ago because of... Um, 2.4 gigahertz, um, I wanted to uh, control a quadcopter uh, on long distance and got a foundation call over a weekend and then found that my foundation call wasn't enough to do anything useful with because I wasn't allowed to do any digital modes. And then I got distracted with um, you know all the other things that Amateur Radio did and now people ask me when am I upgrading and my response to that is when I do my DXCC QRP and I'm 23 countries in so I'll keep going very much. But my question is this. If you are saying it's easy to get into amateur radio and the incentive to get into amateur radio is you can do more, then the incentive isn't covered by an F-call. I do the news every week here in Western Australia and some of you have heard my voice, no doubt. Um, I have to measure how many F-calls are coming into the hobby or I, I, I have been measuring that and we are doubling the hobby every year. So the number of F calls coming into amateur radio is doubling the number of, number of amateurs in our community. So n number of new amateurs, I should say, not doubling our community size. So what that means is that there is definitely 
um, a call for having an amateur license. But if you have that amateur license and you have got your F call, you still can't do anything other than voice and, and hand coded Morse. So all of these Gucci modems and, and all of this RF communications and all of that, you can't use. So we still have this disconnect between what we're offering as a community, you know, in terms of an F call. And the thing that we're patient, we're saying to hackerspaces, and that is, hey, come to Amateur Radio because you can do all this cool stuff. But yes, the the fine the fine print down the bottom is, oh, by the way, you have to spend six months before you get your standard or advanced call before you can actually do anything. So there's still a disconnect in there. No, I disagree. I got my Man, that's standard license on a weekend with half an hour study, right? Not everyone works tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a network engineer, right? I don't know RF. You just go in and do it. It's not that hard. If and if you hang around the technology and the hobby and, and not just amateur radio but electronics and the whole bit, it's not hard. It's not rocket science unless you beat up. Um, <laughs> you know, just do it. it, it just th th there's no excuse really for not putting a weekend studying in. And upgrading your license, if, if that's what your concern is, if you're worried that you you don't have access to those other modes and those other frequencies and those other powers, get off your ass and get your license. It's not no, hard. No, what I'm saying is that the, the, the study processes that we do, the courses that we offer, the material that we have as a community, the thing that we're offering to the people that are wanting to upgrade are all based around a six-month process, not around somebody studying on their own and coming up and doing licenses. There's always going to be exceptions, but if you look around to the various schools that are teaching amateur radio to the community, they're, they're not basing it on a weekend to a standard or a weekend to advanced. They're basing it on a weekend to F-call and then leaving people stranded, and that was my point. Someone up the back first, we'll come back. Um, as all of the protocols in general seem to be heading towards digital and away from analogue, wouldn't it be uh, a good solution to that to lobby to get the digital modes included in the F call? And what does does anybody know what 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 Australian body actually deals with? Uh, no, I, I I got my F call and haven't kept it up. Oh, I haven't written to the ACMA. The response is upgrade. The only way that would ever happen would be to lobby for WIA to then lobby the ACMA. And the last time that happened, it took nearly 10 years of the WIA lobbying the ACMA to change yep. the regulations. Yep. And that's when they released the draft proposal. And then it took, I think, nearly two years from the draft proposal being released to the licence conditions being upgraded to drop the requirement for Morse to the current licensing scheme we have right now. But only because the UK yeah. did it as well. Yes, yeah. but, but it's all about how much knowledge the individual has. The, the foundation licence is aimed at basically back black box operation to get you into the hobby. The difference between a foundation licence is a book that thick, about a quarter, about a quarter inch thick, to the next level, it's about inch and a half. No, it's not. It is. It's not. It's, if you get, you get the information from the Amateur Radio Online School in New South Wales, yeah. the PDFs, uh, the, it's, it's only, I think, about, I don't even think it's 100 pages. It's not that much. You can read it in a weekend. And you can. Yep. On Monday, so, so just to summarise the discussion that's happened without the microphone, um, the, the, there's a, a discussion as to how much work it is and how be, between the foundation and the standard so standard yeah. license. Um, my comment, my comment is, or a question: Is the standard license the appropriate next step, or should should there be a incremental step which allows a small amount of? Yeah, we came from two originally. Did you have Morse code or not? That's right. Uh, right. Um, no, so the question is, 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 is this, and I don't know the syllabus, so I'm asking the question very openly, is the standard class licence, is, is that the appropriate next step or, is, or should there be something different that simply goes, you can do low power on these digital modes with these constraints? Having 
I got my novice licence when they first came out many, many moons ago and then sort of went off and got my advance and what have you. You still, to operate with those other modes and do the experimentation, unless you want to be a black box operator, which is what the foundation licence allows you to do, you still need the knowledge to limit the interference, to do all the other bits and pieces, and that's still, it, the standard licence provides that. You, you must set a basis level for that technical knowledge. If you're already in the hacker space and whatever else and you're building stuff like that, you've got a reasonable knowledge already and it, the novice license, sorry, standard license really isn't a very high level. Yeah. So. You would probably find, surprise yourself, people already playing in hacker space and, and that sort of thing would probably, yeah, it, it, book the exam, sit it and you'd find you'd pass, you know, w without too much effort. You, it, it's you pick it up if you're already interested in playing in that area. It, it shouldn't be a, a barrier. I've gone through the whole licensing debacle relatively recently. About six, seven years ago, I got my F call. And then a couple of years ago, I did the standard course, all well, the training for the theory through my, um, through my club. And... Um, the, the theory book is inch and a half thick, right? But the cut down version that's actually applicable to the, the syllabus is probably half an inch thick because I've gone through that uh, whole thing. Um, so I did the standard training course, but I was, did all the extra work and actually sat the advanced exam. And realistically, the advanced exam is probably five or 10% more reading. So there is very little step between the standard and the advanced theory However, the regulations I found to be far more difficult than the theory stuff. And that is the big hurdle in order to step up from an F call. Um, and however, I would suggest that the standard course is certainly not going to qualify you in um, really thinking about understanding. In fact, none of the theory stuff as the syllabus accounts really prepares you for um, designing in a thing in terms of building radio gear which is going to negate the, the interference issues that you were talking about. Sure, that it tells you the very basic things about, yes, you're going to know, you need to know about interference, but you've got no real tools for dealing with any of that stuff. There's certainly no electronics design in any of that. It's a case of, here's some really basic math, and here's how to plug some stuff together, and this is what inductance and capacitance and resistance is, but go and deal with it yourself. I would absolutely have to agree with that. Um, but that being said, I got my licence... Um, originally 15 years ago I did a novice limited license I was upgraded to a standard when they put the new licensing system in I hadn't touched anything to do with AR theory or electronics or whatnot for nearly 10 years I went through I read the advanced course in the space of a weekend and sat the exam on the Monday and passed and I think that that, that, that that's fundamentally I mean hey I'll take it but I think it's fundamentally wrong it's so easy yeah it's, it's, it's much easier than it used to be yeah. The, 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 the advanced syllabus material now is no harder than the novice limited stuff I did 15 years ago. There's a difference between people who are going to want to transmit on in a digital mode and people who are going to build things to transmit on a digital mode. So you may not want to put those barriers in front of everyone if they're only going to be using things rather than building them. Uh, the problem is that... I've I've got this magic white box that Not takes that, that no that takes uh, an IQ signal in and transmits at whatever power. All the interference and all the problems are going to come in the software where they're experimenting. So you, you you're immediately saying, oh, we've got to do closed source on the software side, yeah. and that's yeah. that's the that's the problem. I, I mean, I don't think it's a simple solution. I just think it's something we as a community needs to debate a bit. Um, we'll have one more question or discussion on this, then we'll move, can we move to some other topic? Because I think we've done, <laughs> we've done that to death, and I think there's probably other things that people can talk about. Your argument that the, the problem in software becomes an open versus closed source. I mean, if I turn my radio on, which I bought from a store, um, I'm assuming it's doing what, I'm, what I bought. But I, as an F-Call, have no way of knowing if it's not doing what it's supposed to do, only when somebody comes knocking on my door and says, hey, Mr. Benshop, what thing are you doing? So 
I don't think there's any difference. Um, the notion that you could actually have um, a digital mode that was um, applicable to an F call, I don't think excludes what you're saying. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think possibly there's a, there's a need for a, something that says, yes, you can do these digital modes. No, it's not the, the full everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. It's, 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 it's sit there. We need the, the vendors to keep up. You know, if, if the radios are there to provide... If the radios are there to provide the black box operation on a subset of digital modes, then there would be the opportunity to vary the conditions of the licence. But until the black boxes are there, there's no point having the licence conditions. Having said that, until the licence conditions are varied, the vendors aren't going to manufacture the radios. So... <laughs> <laughs> and the Australian market's too small. Yeah. All right. this one and, then we'll go on to and from a commercial point of view, what's going to be the market share? You know, are they going to be interested? Is the amateur community large enough to support the uh, uh, to support the market? Uh, up here, you, uh, but I'd really like to get to a different topic in some way. Just. Just, just to spread the discussion around, not, not to stifle it. Sorry, it's a question from IRC and it's a bit late. Um, so if it's supposed to be a device operator licence, what about uh, um, built-in TNCs in a mobile phone handset, for instance? Um. So that's an IRC question. Yeah, yeah so what, what about built-in TNCs? That's an interesting one. Are you talking about like a Z17 or something like that? <laughs> okay, so a slightly different angle on this. Um, license, con license conditions aside, um, if we're looking forwards and going, okay, uh, amateur radio is a thing, um, we need to encourage new people into it, hackerspace is an obvious kind of channel to go, hey, look, guys, let's go and do some cool projects. Um, We've got all these lipids out there which are making random noises on our channels and we've got a lot of users who want to use them because they're going to try and do cool things like fly planes or helicopters or whatever. Um, and I'm always thinking about, hey, what cool kits can we make? Um, and there's all these vendors in China who are going, we could, you know, they're falling over themselves to sell random stuff. Um, the big American vendors and ch Japanese vendors aren't interested in anything complicated. They want to sell big rigs, as, 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 as Jason says. They're not interested in small stuff. They haven't designed anything in the last 10 years. China is falling over themselves to sell anything to anybody. Um, the hacker spaces are going, look, we want to build some interesting things. Maybe we can actually go, dear Chinese companies, please make blah. Um, we had uh, talking about APRS just here and TNCs and so all of that kind of... Uh, other digital stuff that doesn't need a license that could be a lipid, so it could be a nice, you know, get your toes wet doing some interesting stuff. Um, so, I mean, obviously, John's been making various things here with, uh, you know, the Freetronics and the, and the ArduSats, and there's lots of other bits and pieces, lots of other angles in there. Um, surely we should be able to, you know, go, we want to develop stuff in this space and eventually get the manufacturers there because, you know, the Yaesus and ICOMs, they're not interested. They've very specifically shown that they're not interested in making anything, you know, in that sort of space. So, so, so the comment from the room is there's no money in it for a vendor. Um, well, for big vendors. So, yeah, so how do we move it to the right vendors? Then you're back to the situation of convincing a whole lot of hackerspaces to work on one big project. And if anyone's got any ideas to do that, I'd love to hear them. Somebody start an open hardware ham radio company. <laughs> uh, so, so someone start an open hardware ham radio company. Yeah, so there are, there are several around there, right? There, 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 are, there are companies out there that just do that. Um, Softrock's one. Um, the HackRF and the similar things are... You could do exactly the same thing and make it an amateur radio thing. Would we get half a million dollars out of Kickstarter to do it? No, you don't. But that was what Hack we've got. And that's starting to say that there's money out there for the right product. Um, you've got to get because people want the product. That's right. You've got to get... 
Yeah. Uh, so, so the comment was there's money out there for people who wanted the product. Yeah, I think I think the problem with the ham radio um, uh, fraternity is they're trying to target, or they're not targeting the right audience. And where we need to be is, as somebody said, in the schools. Once upon a time, electronics was an integral part of after school activities, or even during school activities, part of the science. It was when I was at school. Um, but then... Yeah, but are they doing amateur radio? No. And that's, and that, and that's the key. So, so the comment was that the gentleman has three kids doing electronics, but they're not doing amateur radio. And that's in the school system. Um, so, oh, amazing. It's the New South Wales school system. Uh, any other comments? <coughs> Any, anything else you want to talk about? A uh, comment on the um, hardware vendors not being interested. The, the ICOMs and the ASUS and the <laughs> Motorola's um, are only going to want to produce very polished equipment. You know, if you've used uh, an ICOM handheld versus a, one of the Chinese manufacturers, there's a big delta between the two. And the Chinese are more than happy to put out stuff that's less than stellar. Um, but that's fine because they can make their margin on it and that's probably, you know, we don't mind so much because we find it interesting to play with and the price is right. And that's probably where we should be aiming is proposing those ideas to the manufacturers who aren't going to produce another, you know, 817 or something like that, happy to, to throw out whatever rubbish they can develop in six months or, or less and, and, and charge is, 50 bucks for it. That delta is decreasing. So, so the comment was, as the Chinese get better, the Delta's getting smaller. Um, so I've got a Chinese El Cheapo. Um, they're about 50 bucks, something like that on eBay. Um, so if that wasn't, if that wasn't closed source, uh, if, if that wasn't closed source, um, if, if we had access to the digital processing on there, because a lot of that radio is digital already. So if we had something that was nearly as generic as that, but it was designed the right way, will we have an audience? Will we have, will we have enough people to buy it? But the vendors won't do that because that's, that's, their, you know, that's their IP. Um, no, no, no. So we go and t talk to whoever, and I'm deliberately not showing who it is, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who it is. If, Most if, already have a software-defined radio in it. That's the way it is. Yeah, yeah. We all have an SDR in our pocket. It's locked up in IP. It's locked up in legalities. It's locked up in government regulations. And it's locked up in telecoms. Well, you're holding up a phone. Not everybody's going to be Correct. able to see it. Correct. Oh, sorry, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's an iPhone, but whatever. Oh, the yeah. baseband processor is an SDR. Yeah, the so... so so, so for the band that that works on, and for the use purposes, that's that's right. It's not going to happen. But so most. What what I'm saying is, could we possibly persuade the manufacturers that there is a big enough? Um, well, is there a big enough well, I just want that's the question. Um, not in all cases, because I still own one of the original Open Mocos, full open source. 3G phones. The base band is um, on that. No, but well, depend on how hard you Google. <laughs> <laughs> Separate to the NDA and stuff. Those radios, just it's interesting that you pick those because the chipset in those is really well documented. Um, and there are a bunch of articles already about using those chipsets for APRS trackers and other things. So that's actually a really good platform if you wanted a VHF, UHF platform where you do have the documentation you need because the RF stuff works, we know that. So you're really just interested in talking to the the, um, the RF chip, and you know, which is also a controller on those, and that is all documented. So that's actually a really good platform, even though you use that as an example of a black box, because well, it's not really. But there's a big difference between hacking commercial products and having an open and free product to sell yeah. on. Yeah. You've got to start somewhere. But 
if it's a good platform, start off with. Yeah, so, so if it's a good, the, the, the point is, if it's a good platform. You usually find that, Yeah. Listen, there's loads and loads of stuff out there about the Oh, yeah, you know, but, but what I'm saying is, could we persuade the manufacturers to build an, to open, build one an open one from the specifically start. there with probably the, the necessary restrictions in some way to force it so it only works in an amateur band? I think the flip side of the, or as a listener, how do you then deal the re with issues like The reverse that? question, I think the, re the, the question is better put the other way, that if a good open hardware design existed for such a thing, would a Chinese company or some other company pick it up and produce it? Right? So we, you know, are they going to invest the R&D effort to go, and, to go and design the thing um, and make it open? Well, that's a harder question. But if there was, an, if there was a pre-existing open hardware design that had a demonstrated market, would they would they then pick that up and and competitively uh, competitively produce it? Right? And I think there are plenty of examples to suggest that they would. The other problem is you've got then the ACMA who's um, trying very hard to lock down or shut out those um, types of radios because they can be unlocked to cover more than the amateur bands and that they are trying to deem them illegal. I know they already have done that. Yeah and that's a problem that if you have an open source radio or sorry an open source hardware platform transceiver um, it's you might be able to procure one, but the local government or the national government is where you're going to have problems. Yeah, so it depends on. I mean, if if it's. That, so the the comment was that the the number of SDR transceivers is is relatively small. Um, I imagine that we would have to, well there's two things, if it's fully open, yes, somebody can go and take the design and build something themselves, that purposes it for whatever, um, that they presumably have enough knowledge to know that they're breaking the law, if they're going to go and take an open source design and build something different. Um, the, if you had a, something that was designed for amateurs, I think you'd have to put some thing in there to make it so it wasn't as wide band as we wanted, as, as might be wanted. So really designing it so it sits you across to one band. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I didn't. Um, as far. As far as um, the Chinese radios not respecting the frequency bands, um, a certain model of ICOM radio, which is rather popular um, in amateur radio, has two components that can be removed from the board that completely unlocks the frequency. I'm not going to name which one it is, but it's pretty common. Um, and... Uh, Yeah, that, that and a lot of others, and also any Atheros wireless card that works on 2.4 can be tuned fairly far out of band in software. So a lot of this hardware that's already around, already in incredibly common use, can do this, and it's not something that's special to the Chinese stuff. Except that it's aside illegal, from and supposedly that, that, that seems to work pretty well as a prevention already. Because as amateur radio operators, we never repurpose a commercial sector. <laughs> so, doesn't that mean that we can deal with that problem of people walking all over the wrong frequencies in the same way we've always dealt with people walking all over the wrong frequencies by reporting them? The, the whole problem with the really cheap um, broadband handhelds um, was discussed. My son, who's also an amateur, had a discussion after posting to VK Logger about, um, I think his Motorola radios, he's a mad fan on them. 
and the RIs in Canberra actually rang him the next day and had an extensive discussion about the whole problem of the broadband Chinese radios and it all came about because of the intentional misuse by a couple of idiots basically in Victoria which made ACMA much more aware of it and wanting to try and address it but they didn't have an answer for why is it illegal and why is your old FT101 which will allow you to transmit on 3.9 megs not illegal and it's never been tested in court and so it all comes down to we're expected to do the right thing with the gear that we have um, and they want to be seen to be doing stuff as well etc so I've got a comment for the, um, the, the, the comment about, you know, if people do the wrong thing, then report them. Um, I, I'll ask this question. Have you ever tried to actually get somebody taken off the air who's doing the wrong thing? Okay, so the, 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 that was a no response. Um, yeah, I have. Um, we had a uh, individual causing problems um, to a club repeater a number of years ago in Victoria and uh, anyone here who keeps up to date with WIA broadcasts would remember about 18 months, two years ago, there was an individual in Victoria that had um, his licence stripped from him and then about six months later he had all of his ex-equipment confiscated and he was prosecuted in court. Now, he had been causing a significant amount of interference to the club repeater for nearly two years. It took 18 months for the ACMA to strip his licence and it took a further six months of him intentionally causing interference after that to have his equipment taken away from him. So it is a very lengthy process. That being said, if it's a commercial entity and you report a commercial entity causing interference to a repeater, the ACMA will be out there within a week. But if it's an individual, good luck, it's a long process. It depends on, on the nature of the interference. Um, well, there we, and, and the mo well, well, the other comment is that I wouldn't be wanting them to put too much effort into um, policing that too much because the way that they will finance it is increasing your license fees because we're supposed to pay for the, our license fees are supposed to pay for the, the service um, so it's now almost quarter past five um, unless there's a new topic I'm going to call it quits um, <laughs> because I think we've done that one to death um, so is there anyone got a new topic yeah, we should reintroduce more code Oh, that we, <laughs> <laughs> that we should reintroduce Morse code. Okay, so can you get a key out tomorrow morning and demonstrate to everyone 60 word a minute keying, please? <laughs> no, no, you can use a, you can use a bug. You can, you can use a side one. Um, okay, right, I thank you all very much. I've enjoyed it. Um, it went better than I was sort of fearing it would at some stage <laughs> early this morning. Um, I would ask you, you've all got my email address if you go looking on the, the chat list, or um, well you've got that email address. Um, please send me feedback as to what you think we should do better next year, because I think we've got enough people come along and enough discussion that we should try to have a, another open uh, radio uh, event next year. And um, I'd hope that several of you here volunteer to, to give a presentation. I don't, yeah. Lightning talks are really good, um, not 90 second ones, a bit longer than that for this sort of venue. Um, but yeah, thank you all very much. And um, if we uh, turn the stuff off now, my suggestion is that if you want to have a bit of a boff now, uh, here's an opportunity uh, to talk about what you want to do and then maybe people want to go somewhere and um, have a meal together or whatever. Um, or maybe some people really are going to rush off to one of the other boffs that are on. There isn't anything in this room, so you can stay as long as you want. Thank you all. <laughs>